We have a wonderful story uh, to tell, and it really is reflective. I mean, many of us go through our daily motions without really thinking about the people that came before us, but I, hopefully one of the lessons or one of the outcomes of this talk um, is to clue you in in terms of really standing on the shoulders of, of the giants that came before us. Uh, today's talk is about pioneers, to, to basically to pick up on Dr. Pieper's theme. The, the American Heritage Dictionary defines pioneer um, as one who ventures into the unknown and onto unclaimed territory to settle. Interestingly, it's also um, an innovative, uh, someone who, an innovator in any field. Interestingly, pioneer also can be a verb, um, and that is to innovate or to develop something, uh, something new. And that's what makes the college really a special place, and that's the theme for today, um, are the people who have decided to break the rules a little bit, bend the rules somewhat, think outside of the box, whatever cliche works for you. Um, but they, they had the personal vision and courage to be able to do these things, and we're sitting here today celebrating the, a, a very happy birthday of, of our college. It really, it, it, when you dig it to the soul of the college, it's a pioneering spirit that embodies grit, determination, vision, and a devotion to hard work to make things better than they have to be, which means not settling for just good enough. Um, it's the spirit of, of it's the, really the spirit of selflessness and generosity also that I think makes the college uh, a special place. One of the things that you'll see from Eugene Massett and almost everybody who followed him, and some of the people do that here on a routine basis that I observe every day, is they people who plant trees under whose shade they will never sit. So the, the bottom line is making the school better for people who are going to come after us. Um, and again, this is really not just the story of the past 150 years, but what are we going to do in the next 150 years? But my portion is about the historical part, and so let's go ahead and start. Um, really, you can divide the college's history into three eras, and we're, the first one, of course, is the founding, um, and it really does reflect the idea of vision and determination. Uh, again, uh, Eugene L. Massett plays a huge role. There were others, certainly, uh, Eno Sander um, and several others, but it really it was Massett, and Massett's backstory is a really interesting one and really illustrative of what we're about. Um, he grew up in Kentucky, uh, moved to Illinois, served as a, worked in a drugstore for four years. Um, he, in 1849, of course, somebody found gold in Ennar Hills in California, and so he decided to seek out his fortune. Fortunately for us, he didn't find anything. Um, and so he came back to St. Louis. Um, he worked in a drugstore, uh, earned enough money to open his own drugstore, and became a very successful uh, druggist, as they called him in those days, or apothecary. But he wanted more than that. Um, he was a traveler. He was a restless soul. Uh, he traveled to uh, Philadelphia. Uh, he spent some time at the Philadelphia College of Pharmacy, and he was very interested in this new thing called American Pharmacy. Interestingly, in 1852, the year he opened his own store, um, he also, um, part well, he, he witnessed some of the activities leading up to the founding of the American Pharmacist Association, or American Pharmaceutical Association, as it was known then. Um, he comes back, and as Dr. Pieper told you, there were several meetings. Um, he needed to get support from civic leaders and from physicians and from his fellow apothecaries, and they came together. And on this very day, uh, in, on a Friday evening at 7.30, they put forth the Constitution. The next thing they did, uh, a few days later, is to contract the building. Uh, now, that wasn't, the, it's, this looks a lot more elegant than it was. We had one, one room on the fourth floor of that particular building. It was called Pope's Building, because the dean of the St. Louis College of uh, Medical College, which would later become actually uh, one of the founding schools for the Washington University Medical School. We had one room, and our total budget was $286, which mostly went for chalkboard and chalk. What is more important is really the vision and the values and the words that we live by. You know, a lot of people today talk about, well, if you're going to do a startup, which the college was, a 19th century startup, so how do you do that? And ultimately, these words are the ones that we live by. Um, the St. Louis College of Pharmacy will respond to all requirements that may be demanded of it. Its standard of education is high, and it will be its constant effort to afford every facility to the students to reach that standard. 
As, it means, as its means become ample and opportunities more extended, it is hoped that this career will be more rapid and that it will rival its sister schools and its advantages and facilities for study, never forgetting the ultimate object to sustain pharmacy among the circle of sciences and place, it, uh, place its followers in the highest rank of scientific men. Well, what do you see there? Um, you see a number of things. Basically, you see a, a devotion to service, um, putting others' needs before one's own. You also see high standards, and more importantly, support for those high standards. And then also, an unwavering commitment to excellence, um, to always never settling, always looking for the next, the next innovation, the next big thing. Um, and that's really the theme. Now, one of the things that Massett and his, com and his compatriots did was to, um, the college uh, got its charter in 1866, and you see a copy of our first constitution right there. And there have been several of those um, bylaws since. In terms of innovation, uh, one of our very first graduates was the gentleman on the right in your, on the screen, and that is uh, Otto Wall, um, arguably one of the most interesting faculty members that the college has ever had. Um, Otto Wall uh, was a physician as well as a graduate. He graduated in our first class in 18, 1868. Uh, he was among 14 others, um, and he spent the next, once he got hired, he spent the next 49 years of his life at the college teaching a number of subjects. Um, one of his innovations is what you see on the, on the left, which is the stereo opticon. Now think about it, this is 1874, barely the time when people had electricity, and he is already showing slides. <laughs> And if you recognize the pharmacy faculty, you probably will recognize, if you remember your pharmacognosy, you'll see that he's talking about uh, opium or, or uh, what is it, uh, papaver, somniferum, I believe. And what you see there is a collection, of, uh, a collection of lantern slides. The college boasted about 400 of these slides that they accumulated over time, and they were used for a variety of classes. There was a history of pharmacy class. The top one there on the, on the right was uh, a historical uh, scene from a medieval manuscript. Uh, down at the, uh, at, at the bottom are lantern slides based on uh, a chemistry class. And so we, we basically believe very heavily in visual learning. Uh, one, in terms of other pioneers, um, these are two remarkable young women who decided to press their luck at a time when women could not vote. Um, this is about 28 years before women get the vote. And what you see on is the, uh, the woman on the left was an English immigrant, uh, Esther Whiteman, um, and she came to the United States, lived in Louisville for a while, went to pharmacy school there, um, didn't finish. They came to St. Louis, and she sent an application into the Board of Trustees, and the board basically said, why not? So in 1881, uh, the college has its first woman student. Uh, Esther went on to um, become the first woman licensed to practice pharmacy west of the Mississippi River, uh, and she opened uh, two stores that she operated in St. Louis um, until her death in the late 1890s. Um, on the right is the first woman graduate of the college, uh, Augusta Bach. She was the daughter of a uh, prominent um, physician in St. Louis, um, and when you think about um, the history of, of women at the college, it, it really has been um, a, a remarkable journey. Uh, one of the other pioneers who you know very much be, uh, well about, and you recognize the name because we have a building on campus named after him, is Henry Welpley. Welpley um, joined, the, he was a, a star pupil. Um, he graduated, got the alumni medal in both his junior and senior years. Uh, in the program, graduated in uh, 1883. He would join the faculty in 1887 um, as, a pro as an instructor in microscopy, uh, which would, of course, today be microbiology. Um, and again, this is a very risky thing to do at this particular point because humoral theory was still one of the prevailing theories of what make people sick. The college basically said, you know what? We think germs make people sick. Um, and this became a required class and Welpley was, uh, be ultimately became a professor in that subject. He taught many others, physiology being among them, um, and then later would become dean. Um, and on what you see there is the microscopy lab and then on the lower right, you see a conglomerate of what might be some of the best faculty, uh, you know, the best uh, five faculty members ever assembled. Uh, at the college. Otto Walls in the middle, he was a dean. Uh, James Good, 
Uh, to his left was a dean, uh, also a president of APHA. Welpley himself was a president of APHA, but Welpley really made his mark with APHA for serving as its treasurer for 21 years. He essentially put the uh, APHA on, so on solid financial footing. He was instrumental in starting AACP as well as ACPE and all the other alphabet soups that you can imagine um, in pharmacy world he was part of. Uh, just a remarkable uh, character. Um, this is for the students. When you, when you go to commencement, you're probably going to feel like those folks did. Um, that's the, uh, that's, uh, uh, and they're rejoicing. Uh, the class of 1893, and this is a, a scene in front of the building that was just before the college moved to Jones Hall in Parkview Place uh, in Euclid. Um, and this is a year after it was constructed. And you can see they're happy, they're confident, ready to face the future. Pioneers in their own right, as every student is here. Uh, pharmacy school hasn't ever been easy, and it's still not. Um, it is a slippery slope, but it's a slope certainly worth climbing. Um, what you see here is the chemistry lecture lab. Uh, notice the newfangled uh, light bulbs in, the, in electricity. It had purified water. Um, and they paid some homage to uh, uh, prominent figures in, the, in chemistry. You see the portraits of some of them in the back on the lectern. Um, the next phase is we call building the college community. And that's really sort of consolidating the foundation that our founders had already put into place. Uh, here's Welpley again, he's dean, uh, in 1904 to 1926, um, he becomes the sixth dean of the college, and you'd say, well, okay, so what did he do? Well, it, the, the class schedule, which everybody thinks Penny Bryant makes, um, <laughs> basically she does, um, but we live by that time. Time is an interesting thing because it's an ultimate social construct. Um, and we don't even, you know, nobody really bothers to think, where did that come from? Well, it came from Henry Welpley. Welpley was a medical doctor as well as a pharmacist, and ultimately his idea was to put pharmacy education on an equal footing with medical education. So, in the year of the World's Fair in 1904, he decided, um, along with the faculty, that we would become a full time, a full daytime attendance program in which the didactic classes would be held Monday, through Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, largely from 9 to 5, roughly, and Tuesdays and Thursdays would be reserved for laboratory. The only difference is uh, electives in those days were offered on Wednesday afternoons, but almost everything else had remained the same. Um, this is, of course, the college uh, in 1927. Uh, if you notice, uh, you know, folks sometimes remark that it, in the, the old building kind of looked like a factory, and there's good reason for that. That was the shoemaking manufacturing sector of St. Louis at that point. Um, and if you remember the old building, you remember the columns, and you remember, you know, it, it looked like you could easily put machines in there and automate the place. Um, and so it, the college really kind of fit into the neighborhood at that particular point. What was really remarkable was the college's pioneering effort in developing what was called commercial pharmacy classes. We were the first in the country to do that in the early 1900s, um, and we tried to make uh, opening a pharmacy. Uh, students worked in groups. They got $2,500 or $5,000 in play money and essentially were told, your job this semester is to research a location and open a pharmacy and to scock it and to be able to pay your clerks and make it viable. Um, and they were graded on, they actually in the window displays. Now in 1927, this is uh, actually on campus. And if you look at the floor in both pictures, you could see that I'm not, I'm telling the truth here because the alabaster floor of the old staircase um, is still there. And this was on the ground floor. The, uh, on the left, you see an external view on the inside. And the faculty basically ran the pharmacy and the students ultimately um, it served as technicians and learned uh, how to become a pharmacist right here on campus. And it was a fully operational pharmacy. And it lasted into the late 1950s. One of the other, uh, when it, it, you know, it's hard to think about being able to replace a towering figure like uh, Henry Welpley. And Welpley, uh, true to his nature, um, I think the one thing that probably bothered uh, Welpley's conscience was that he would never be caught being idle when his maker came calling. And he lived up to that. He, he ultimately attended an MPA meeting, uh, MPHA meeting out in uh, Kansas City, and he passed in 1926 very suddenly. Um, and it was a daunting task uh, to succeed Welpley, especially when plans for a new building, which is our 1927 building, were coming into fruition. 
Um, Kaspari uh, was the son of uh, uh, Charles Kaspari Sr., who was the uh, dean of the University of, or the uh, Co Maryland College of Pharmacy. Um, Kaspari himself, Jr., uh, known as Cas to his friends, uh, was an analytical chemist. Uh, he wasn't a pharmacist, but he was very interested in drug and food purity, which was a major issue because at those days, um, it was before the 1938 uh, Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, and he was instrumental along with George Reddish, a bacteriologist who worked along with him at the college in the 30s, in making that so. Um, one of the fun facts about Kaspari is the fact that he may, he worked also for, as a consultant to Robert Woodruff, the president of Coca-Cola, and may be one of the few people on the planet that actually had access to the secret formula uh, of Coca-Cola. Um, he uh, was a remarkable figure. Uh, he raised about $350,000 to build uh, Jones, what is today Jones Hall, which in, you know, this is two years before the Great Depression, um, and people, including students, willingly chipped in to make that happen. Um, Kaspari also, we, he guided us through the Great Depression, uh, the early stages of World War II. Um, sadly, he took ill uh, in the spring of uh, 1942, but he didn't give up. Uh, basically, at that point, the college, it, things were dim, just as they were for the country in general. We were fighting a war which we might have lost. Um, that's hard for people today to believe, that the United States might actually be able to lose a war. Um, we almost lost the college. Uh, we were $100,000 in debt. Um, Kaspari, though, continued, even though he was sick, um, uh, basically trying to raise money, which he did. Uh, he called upon Robert Woodruff, his friend at Coca-Cola, and other donors uh, in order to try to put the college back on a solid footing. Um, and uh, he, uh, one of the other things, certainly, is he, from his sickbed, he also, um, he also was able to um, essentially run the daily affairs of the college. Um, during the time of trouble financially, he accepted no pay. Um, and he actually, there is evidence of him taking substantial amounts of money from his own personal savings to keep the college going. Um, and he referred to the college as his baby. One of the things that occurred, um, which may come as a surprise, one day when I was strolling around in the archive room, um, I found some pictures of, of some uh, Japanese Americans, and I was wondering, okay, so what's the story there? And there is a really interesting story. And it comes out of one of the darkest chapters, certainly, in, uh, uh, in American history, and that is the internment of uh, Japanese Americans primarily on the west coast of the United States. Um, President Roosevelt, and I guess, at the time, folks were in the United States, was, it was a time of great fear. Um, and so Japanese Americans were forced to sell their businesses. Uh, pharmacy students who were attending school were dismissed uh, academically uh, from pharmacy programs. And it looked hopeless. But through the work of some, some of the major pharmacy organizations and negotiations with the American government, um, three pharmacy schools in the Midwest were, were uh, chosen for Japanese American pharmacy students who wanted to go, to go. And, and, the, and St. Louis College of Pharmacy was one of them. Fourteen um, of, uh, Japanese American uh, pharmacy students graduated between 1944 and 1947. And one of them you see there, um, I, don't, I can't use my pointer or it will do something weird. Uh, uh, but you can see Mildred Doy, class of 46, there um, on, the, on the far right. After the war, it was a time of great expansion for the college. A number of new programs came in. The college was renamed the St. Louis College of Pharmacy and Allied Sciences. Um, it would remain that name until 1962. Um, and, a number, and the reason for it, there were a number of master's programs, master's of science programs in, in industrial pharmacy, uh, in bioassay, and in hospital pharmacy. Uh, and what you see on the right is probably a few were, uh, well, our alumni got a kick out of it because many of them got a chance to do that. I got a chance to go on one of these, and that was the, the senior trip to a pharmaceutical company. And the, in those days, Lilly or Park Davis or any of the major pharmaceutical companies in the Midwest used to sponsor these trips, and they would take a bus trip. And they would go, and they would wine and dine them. They would see research facilities, get lectures, and generally have a good time. And it was a great bonding exercise. The pharmaceutical companies, sadly, um, curtailed that uh, in the, in the mid-1990s. Um, there are two people who are in that picture, and again, I'm going to try this once to see if it will help. But Phyllis Sarich is in that picture, and Charlie Robbie. They're in the front row. 
Uh, Phyllis is in the second seat uh, from my right, and then Charlie Robbie, as a faculty member, is the next one over. And of course, Charlie Robbie would later become the first salary president of the College of Pharmacy. One of the other things that occurred during the 1950s um, uh, was uh, there were some negotiations uh, between the Mound City uh, Pharmaceutical Association and the Board of Trustees of the college. And in 1952, the college um, admitted its first African-American students. Um, this is the class of 1956 um, in terms of St. Louis College of Pharmacy and Allied Sciences um, graduates, Richard Crumble, Thomas Jones, and T.J. Williams, as he was known. Um, our first female African-American graduates were Doris Griswold Bryson, Viola Graham, and Margaret Brown. Uh, again, pioneers all in their own right, especially at a time before the Civil Rights Act was passed in 1964. Speaking of pioneers, certainly Charlie Robbie uh, was one of them. I mean, we didn't have, the, prior to Charlie Robbie, um, the presidents of the college were, chair, were the elected chairmen of the Board of Trustees, and they served without salary, and they, were, uh, they, they performed in ceremonies, and help the college as much as they could, but things became very complex um, in terms of finances and everything else, in terms of operating a modern college. So the Board of Trustees uh, selected Charlie Robbie to uh, do that, and they probably couldn't have made a better choice. In 1961 to 1983, um, he increased the size of the school. The old dormitory was built on his watch. Robbie Hall was dedicated in 1981 uh, in his honor uh, for uh, married students and upperclassmen to live in. And ultimately, uh, he was able to put the college for once on a solid financial footing. Uh, to the left, you'll notice the gala. Um, in 1964, one of the great highlights of his uh, particular tenure as president was the uh, centennial celebration, of which, if you were there last night, you got a chance to recreate the 150th in the same mode as what you see there on the screen. Um, if, uh, hopefully, many of you were able to attend. And if you didn't, you really missed a great time. Uh, our second president was uh, Sumner Robinson, who came to us from the uh, Massachusetts College of Pharmacy, and he ultimately wanted to create the whole, co the whole college experience for our students and spent a great deal of time uh, revamping the curriculum, modernizing it, um, and ultimately what you see there are some of the fruits of that. The student center was built in 1986. Parking garage would be built in 1993-94. Um, what you also see at the bottom is inside the old student center. It, what that, that purple thing there is not Barney uh, in a white coat. That's actually um, Rex, who was our first mascot. Um, and Rex, they used to have a Rex parade where student organizations would parade on Parkview Place and things like that. So um, it, uh, President Robinson made some great inroads in terms of, of, of boosting student morale and, and things like that. And he also set us on the course for re-entering intercollegiate sports. Uh, which would occur just after his uh, time here uh, in 1994. And then our third president, uh, uh, Dr. Thomas Patton, um, ultimately continued in building that whole college experience, revamping the curriculum, uh, modernizing facilities. Um, at the time, there was a $42 million renovation uh, of the whole campus from 2000 to 2003. Many of the faculty lived through that, plaster falling in your classes and all kinds of exciting surprises. Uh, jackhammers going off at different times, um, but we lived through it and we're so much better for it. Um, one of the other things is at this particular time in the 90s and through his particular tenure at the school was the development of IT and the importance of um, computers. Now you can see it's important because if our IT goes out, uh, you know, if, if the network goes down for five seconds, people are up in arms and they don't know what to do. Um, so you can see that, you know, oh, my iPad doesn't work or, you know, whatever. I mean, and so it, it's, uh, you know, you, and under his watch, every student got a laptop, every faculty member, and that's something that has become an expectation in, at the school. Um, the, um, uh, oh, the eutectics, probably one of the better stories there. Um, and you remember the pillbox, the old gym, which is no more. Uh, and on the wall there was the old eutectic. Now, uh, Time Magazine has called it the worst mascot in the country. Um, ESPN has told us that it is the uh, most esoteric. They were a little more polite. And what I find ironic is that we live in a town that has Gorlocks and Billikens. Really? <laughs> 
So what you see there uh, at the bottom part is really the passing of the baton from, uh, of, from the old eutectic who is white coating uh, the uh, Morty McPestle. Morty has a name, the old eutectic was simply the eutectic. And it was time for him to go. I was the eutectic a couple times and the old eutectic was really nasty. <laughs> <laughs> Um, uh, well, at any rate, <laughs> on that note, okay. Um, and in 2010, um, again, in the spirit, when we think back at pioneers, um, and we think back at Eugene Massett, and we think about well, Henry Welpley, and we think about Charles Kaspari and Charlie Robbie, and all these great leaders, um, we were very fortunate to have Dr. Pieper join us in, in 2010. Um, and I think it's fair to say that um, it's very rare to have an occasion like we had at the gala last night and a celebration of the history, the rich history of this college. And to have um, a, a, a college president who, who understands that fundamentally in his bones is remarkable. Um, uh, and uh, what you see at the uh, at top there, if you all remember, at the inauguration, you contributed stones, and it's on the second floor, on the second floor staircase, and it's symbolic of what this whole thing is about. It's a symbolic one, each one teach one, uh, each one help one, um, and it's that pioneering spirit that keeps us going. Um, and at the bottom, of course, everybody's familiar and we're all working on the different strategic, the Still Cop 2020 plan, and everybody has a piece of that. Everybody who's sitting in this audience has a particular piece of that. And so with that, I'll, I'll turn the program back over to Dr. Pieper. Thank you.